echo across every single screen now. <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for coming and um, pa the panel, thank you so much for being here. Um, I thought it would be a good uh, kind of quite timely point to do this conversation because I think we're probably all in agreement that when you first leave art school, whether it's from undergrad or even after postgrads, depending on how long you've had in between, it's still quite a kind of daunting time. And um, with the fact that most universities have just submitted, it's that time that students are kind of preparing towards the next steps and starting to think about what 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 will happen um, after art school. So the idea for today's panel is to kind of address some of those issues and hopefully give food to thought um, going forwards. Um, I'll let you guys in the panel, can you just really quickly give a little introduction of who you are and then we'll go into the first question. So, Alice, do you want to go first? Quick. Um, I'm Alice Stephan. I'm a sculptor. I went to art school with uh, Susie up in Glasgow School of Art, uh, probably about 12 years ago now, Suze. Um, and I currently work for an artist in London and have my own practice and share a studio with Susie up in Tottenham. Brilliant. Thanks. And um, Sam, do you want to go next? Uh, hi, I'm Sam Baker. Um, I did my BA in Fine Art at Kingston University. Uh, I've since completed a master's from the Royal College of Art in Sculpture um, and I am an art lecturer. Um, Ian, I think you're next. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ian Walter. Ma I graduated from the Cambridge School of Art uh, four years ago, I think, um, and I'm now planning to do a master's but quite, haven't quite worked out how I want to do it. Um, my practice sits somewhere between, uh, I'm a sculptor, but I sit between figurative sculpture and very political art, and somewhere there. Thanks, Ian. And Rosanna? Hi, I'm Rosanna Dean. Um, I started my BA in, Cam uh, gosh, in Paris um, in illustration. Um, I then took a break, worked for an artist, ended up finishing in Camwell and Fine Art. And then um, after quite a long break, I then went to the RCA and did painting. Um, and my current practice is a mix between, I guess, like performance, installation, painting, workshopping. So uh, yeah, real, real mad mix. <laughs> cool. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we'll go for the first question, a bit of, maybe a bit of a tough one. Um, can you talk a little bit about the biggest challenges you've had to overcome since graduating from either BA or MA? Anyone who wants to go, go first. Can I dive in? Yeah. So as I graduated, I won a big prize. And then in the two following years, I won big international prizes. And I thought that's what this was going to be like. And it turns out it isn't. So I thought winning big prizes internationally would be just, you know, what I would do. And so I think if you do have some early success, uh, it's really important that you keep your uh, developmental practice going uh, and don't get disheartened if you don't keep hitting, you know, high notes. Uh, I think you're either winning or you're learning and you're not necessarily doing both at the same time. Does that make sense? Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I can chime in as well. Um, I think for me, the hardest time actually was around degree show, like this time last year. There was that, uh, like when we'd finished, there was such a there was such like a big anticlimax really and like not knowing what to do with what, with yourself and I think there was a lot of expectation as well from students of, and a lot of comparison and and whether you whether you want that to be the case or not I think often you know in that environment you're comparing your success or what you deem like lesser success in that show is I think that's quite a hard hard time to deal with um, and. And I found, I actually found that um, after a couple of months of like really not knowing what to do, that I I reached out to a friend and she recommended a residency that was very open and just took a few weeks 
just processing what was happening away from away from London like that that I found really helpful um and this and the struggle because it really was a struggle for the first few months I think the struggle and like um the, yeah I think the difficulties that came with that actually made me much stronger and much more determined um in the you know after um because I felt like I had less to lose I suppose and then after that things started happening again yeah yeah. I think um, I agree with Ian in a way that um, when I was, especially when I was at art school, my shit didn't stink. Like I knew exactly what I was doing. I was quite arrogant about it because, like, I just I think because you could put everything into your practice. You know, like that's the beauty of art school. Like everything is about that. Um, and then coming out of that, I don't know why, I just had never thought about how I was going to make any money and to like to eat and live. And I mean, that was the biggest struggle, I think, kind of try. And I think even still, you know, 10 years on trying to get the balance of working and still doing my practice and also having a life and actually seeing people and having those conversations. Um, I think that was kind of the biggest and still can be like, you know, one of the biggest problems with being, yeah, well, being a London artist, especially. Yeah, um, yeah, for me, the biggest challenges, uh, both the, sort of after my BA and MA was um, time and money and that sort of work life balance. Mm. Um, and the way I sort of thought about it was, is there a way that I could somehow earn money? while still kind of having access to facilities or being in a position where I could still make work. Um, so sort of playing around with whether it's part time work or technician kind of jobs, somewhere where you still got that sort of access to sort of making facilities, I think definitely helped me quite a lot. I think it's really important as well at that, like when I when I graduated, I suddenly felt like I was back where I started. I felt like I was applying for jobs, you know, that, that yeah. I for when I was like 19. And I was just like, what the hell have I done? Um, but but then after getting over that, I, I really obviously not having money and like not knowing what to do. It really forced me into acknowledging the skills I did have in a different capacity um, and just being quite, quite brazen about that to people and just offering services which I would never have thought before you know just like produ like producing shows or helping people organize studios or you know things which just I'd done all my life but I, I never really put a price tag on properly I suppose. and that gave me freedom to then take some other risks yeah Brilliant. thank you guys um Ian I know I have a question specifically for you um it's about uh, your experience going to art school slightly later in life and having um, juggling having your own business alongside being a practice. Um, yes, when I went for my interview at the Cambridge School of Art, the, the guy who I asked whether I'd be the only mature student and he said, no, you know, we get about 20% of every year is mature. Well, when I started, the next nearest in age to me was 24 or maybe 25, which, you know, I was 45. Um, so uh, did that matter? No, I, I had a fantastic three years at the Cambridge School of Art. I've made some really, really good friends that have lasted. Um, I had an absolute ball and I, and I think had I gone to university when I was 18, 19, as some of the students did, I wouldn't have got half as much out of it. So I'm glad I've done it the way I did. Um, having a, a business alongside, um, it was always very shocking for the other students when I was an undergrad to see me on odd days when I had a suit on, which felt really normal to me, but they thought was really weird. Um, but I, the thing that I've struggled with is sort of authenticity. It, the, the, the constant nagging voice in the back of my head of, will people think this is a hobby? Do you know, this is something I do when I'm not running my business. Whereas I see this really as something I've 
always it's always been within me it's always been there and the, I had to get to a stage in my business that it could support me to do it but uh, I do struggle with that sort of authenticity I hate the idea I'm seen as a, a hobbyist which I'm probably not really kind of overcome that or is it I don't know no no not really I you know I, I have this idea that my art career should be financially self-sufficient and it isn't and I don't even know how I could ever get it there you know um, but hey most artists aren't financially self-sufficient from art so you know I don't know why I worry about it so much really <laughs> Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, Rosanna and Sam, could you talk a little bit about um, your the difference between your experiences of your MA and your BA and kind of um, also a little bit about the time in between or any any advice that you have for applying as well? So kind of that, that whole experience of post, post BA up to MA basically. Yeah, um, so for me, I took two years out between my um, my BA and my MA, and um, that was a chance to basically take a step back from my practice um, to see how it kind of uh, manifests outside of the institution. So, you know, at, at art school, I was always obsessed, particularly on my BA, with making things big and, you know, using everything in the workshop that I possibly could, um, whereas when you're suddenly your studio has moved to home to like a sort of kitchen table. You've got to think about how, you know, you can work with other sort of ubiquitous materials around the home. Um, so I went from making these enormous sort of sculptures to these sort of small scale maquettes almost. Um, and that was a really nice period to sort of to make without kind of scrutiny from others, without having that sort of critical interaction. Um, but that only lasts for a certain amount of time. You do start to kind of need that um, in order to inform the work a bit more. Um, with regards to why I chose the Royal College, um, I'd always gone to the, the summer shows and I think the best advice for anyone who's applying for a master's is see what the previous students have made um, because that's the best way to give you an idea of sort of um, who's teaching on the course, what kind of facilities are available, what the studio space is like. Um, and I just felt like my work always fit with the general sort of ethos that the Royal College offered. Um, the main difference between BA and an MA is, I'd probably say, dedication and application. Um, and a master's can really consume your life. Um, and you begin to question why you're making in much greater depth. And you really sort of appreciate the input of the peers around you. I think I took them um, a little bit for granted on my BA. On a master's, it's kind of you're, you're such a sort of a group, a cohort together, um, and you're there to sort of, I guess, compete against one another, but also support each other. Um, and I think you know, on a master's, everyone is engaged, um, which perhaps you don't necessarily get throughout your time on a BA. Lots of people on my BA, they sort of, they completed their three years and they never made a piece of artwork again. Uh, masters, everyone is sort of switched on from day one and ready to go. I'm not sure I was. <laughs> no. um, I think, um, I think the, well, first of all, I, I did my BA in illustration first and then I was in, I was, I moved universities and stuff as well. Um, so I had a break in the middle of my BA. So I always kind of felt like it was quite disjointed. And I was I was always sort of doing like one year here and then working and then coming back. And, and I didn't really get that feeling of being like like a part of something very much in my BA. I really struggled with that. Um, and I really focused on just like, I guess, just on painting and wrestling with being a fine artist rather than an illustrator or, or someone propping up someone else's practice, which is how I what I was doing for work at that point um but the in-between time but again that that thing about having about having people around you that are engaged with your practice and their practice 
Um, what I found really helpful, I managed to get a studio straight after, which I was really lucky to do. Um, but um, but it was more of a make, it was more of like a design studio. It was less of a fine art studio. Um, and I was working for a gallery at the time and I just started doing my own studio visits. I just started like getting people together from all sorts of different sort of institutions or backgrounds and, and just organized it off my own back. And, and I really, I loved doing that. And actually the artists loved, loved it as well. So I was seeing people who were like fantastic painters and people doing all sorts of different things at different points in their career and just reaching out to them and asking and they, they enjoyed that feedback. So I think it's really important like when you're out to just think, just, just create your community actually as much as possible because I think it's really needed um, and people appreciate it. Anyway, um, and then I applied, I did the Florence Trust in between the BA and MA which is a residency in Canterbury, and um, and that was a really lucky situation. I just got to paint for a year, and again, be surrounded by like fantastic artists, but they were more multidisciplinary than than I um, than I was used to because I was just doing painting, um, which pushed me to apply for the RCA actually, because I really thrived in that environment and like talking to artists, not just in, within my own practice. Um, and I loved that in the Royal College and I wish I'd been a bit more forthright with how I just went and demanded things rather than being a bit polite because I don't think the RCA is anywhere to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it, I don't know, anything else? Um, thanks, Emma. Um, that kind of leads on to, I guess, um, well, uh, a question to, Ian and Alice, I know Ian, you kind of alluded to it earlier about um, wanting to do an MA, but um, are you are you both are you thinking about doing it? Um, have you kind of gone through the process of it in any way yet? And and then I guess to everyone on on the back of that, do you think it's necessary to do to do one? What are your thoughts on? Everyone Alice, do you want to? Yeah, I um I applied for an MA in my like mid 20s probably like two or three years after um i graduated and i didn't get in and i was a bit of a kind of sorry loser about it um but actually looking back even currently you know five years since then i think i actually need another few years to get myself to a place where i could really utilize that time um and i think actually doing it earlier on might have been the wrong time for me actually that I had to live a little bit and work out this you know it's definitely something that I really want to do um and have like the material like life material in me to then to then utilize that um so I think not at the moment but I think you know five five years time and I think it's not necessary but I mean, I, I, what can I say? I just really want to do one. I mean, how indulgent to just really work on your practice. And, you know, and also that lovely thing of meeting other people that are like you. It's just invaluable. Um, so that's why I'd like to do one, but not at this very point in my life. Yeah, I, I think that's key is, is um, it's going to be different for everyone what time is most appropriate for them to do an MA. Um, and some people that is directly after a BA. You know, some people are on a real sort of roll with their work and it just feels right to continue on. But other yeah. people, you know, 10 year gap is is what's right for them because they've they've got other things they need to be doing and, and learning. Yeah. Um, with regards to whether kind of an MA needs to be, a, you know, a higher education institution. Uh, again, I think that's up to the individual and it, it needs to be thought about about what their needs are and what they want to get from the course. Um, you know, an experience at the Royal College is going to be different to what you get at the Slade or a Goldsmiths. Um, whereas, you know, alternative programmes, um, you know, that sort of are going on in Croydon or outside of London, um, you know, out in Bristol, whatever they are, um, they sound really interesting. And again, there's something that you know, I would encourage other people to look at as well. Um, I mean, in Europe as well, and like other courses, and you know, 
at different institutions. I don't think I don't think always it's the best thing to just stay in the UK if it's possible. Although obviously that's not possible all the time. But, yeah. But, yeah, I don't, you know, finishing with a certificate at the end isn't isn't what we do it for. It's it is about the sort of um, the time, the sort of generous generosity of the people around us, um, that sort of interaction with with lecturers um, is what's really important. So if you're you know a painter and actually you think the people that Terps Banana work with are right for you, then that's you know the art school you should go with. Um, and you know it doesn't necessarily matter that you're not finishing with a master's at the end. You know it's it's something else which is just as just as equally important. Having said that, yeah, mm. um, uh, and I completely agree with what you just said, Sam. But nevertheless, leaving with the certificate from the Royal College does help, doesn't it? It does. It has a function. Um, interestingly, for now, who knows? Who knows? I, th I think that the way higher education, you know, is going, you know, is it putting more people off going? Is it, you know, is it sort of tainted in some way because of what's what's going on with um, student strikes, sort of inequalities in, in institutions at the minute? You know, the whole kind of system just feels completely broken. And you've got, you know, tutors and lecturers who are working so bloody hard for the students and they're not necessarily getting what they deserve from the top. Um, so, you know, I, I would definitely encourage people to explore alternative forms of, of education as well as, you know, traditional institutions as well. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it was a real mindset thing where I thought I thought I wanted to go to the RCA like mm. for so many years. And it was a real battle like it was it was a hard it was definitely a hard couple of years my god like my own scrutiny other people's scrutiny like actually being quite disillusioned by the environment as well like it is yeah. a, a tough it is tough to watch the tutors go through and like everybody yeah the technicians mm. um but um but I think that I did definitely gain something but I think that was more within my own preconceived ideas of what I needed to do like so yeah, I, I agree with you entirely. I think there's there's other mm -hmm. things that are, that may be of more benefit. And I've got friends who haven't done MAs but are doing you know fantastically well. Um, yeah, I think there's a big shakeup that's mm -hmm. coming. Definitely, I don't think I don't think a MA at the RCA is the same as or, or is going to mean the same thing. Mm -hmm. Leaving. Um, but of course, it's an incredible privilege. Like my God, to to be able to just Mm -hmm. to just be there and and fight with yeah. it's such yeah. a privilege, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, that leads us on nicely to um, the potential elephant in the room or in the digital space. Uh, the idea, the kind of, I guess it's quite, it's kind of perpetuated by the art world, this idea that London is the place to be and you have to be based in London and I guess well three of you are currently based in London Ian's outside of London so um if you guys could talk a little bit about whether it's whether it's essential and how how you feel about this or what what are the advantages or disadvantages of being in a, a big city for your practice you <laughs> Um, I've I've always wanted so I was sort of brought up um, brought up in Northampton, uh, which hasn't really got which well, certainly didn't when I was younger any art scene at all. Um, so I always kind of felt that London was the place you know to be an artist, and I ended up sort of travelling to Kingston, seeing the studios there, and knowing its sort of proximity to London thought it'd be the best place for me to, to, to study. Um, and I think for my practice, um, I'm, oh, I'm always keen to sort of see more things. So whether that's sort of exhibitions, um, artist talks, um, other kind of cinema, uh, seminars or symposiums, um, and they do tend to take place in, in London. Um, so that's why for me, I currently live on the sort of the outskirts kind of zone six. So I've got this balance of 
um, you know, getting a bit more for my money, but also I, I can be in Waterloo in 20 minutes. Oh, and let's face it, the art world in the UK is utterly London centric, isn't it? Much mm. more than it is in other countries. You know, I spend a lot of time in France and Bordeaux and Toulouse have got really cool art, art scenes. Whereas, you know, where do you find that in England? It's uh, it's bizarre. So, yes, we'll be moving back to London at some point. <laughs> but then do you think this whole situation is going to change that? Like, I mean, obviously, there's a few there's a few pops, pockets of places like Margate's obviously becoming like like quite an important space for galleries as well as artists. Um, I mean, for over the last few years, I'm so lucky. Like I live in a guardianship. I've managed to get a studio, you know, like, but I've also had to sacrifice like a crazy amount of stuff, in, including making time and like, you know, materials and stuff because it's so expensive to be here. Um, but and, and saying that as well, because like my practice is based in like dance and and like um, anthropology, like seminars and things like that. So like being here, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have been able to do that. I don't think anywhere else. Like we're so lucky to have that here. Um, but I mean, in lockdown, it's been quite revolutionary to be doing like dance workshops online, which I know isn't the same thing, but you still have access to that or like anthropo anthropology lectures online, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I think it's interesting. It's making me want to. I want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm tired of this place. And also well, if the newspapers are to be believed, uh, there is a a move out of London. Yeah, do we ever believe the newspapers? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I'm not a great believer that the lockdown will massively change things structurally. Mm. I I think. Pretty quickly, we'll get back to how it was before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm sure we will. But I mean, it has shown some possibilities of like different ways of doing things. I think whether that will be continued or not, it like, makes me feel a little bit more hopeful that we don't have to be in this city all the time. Because yeah. I do think it's a problem for the country, like 100 percent. This this focus mm -hmm. on London, I think. Um, put so much pressure on people and I also think like as much as it's amazing to be surrounded by all this stuff all the time I also think it's quite distracting for a lot of people too like that they may be seeing more shows than they're spending time in their studio or like feeling like they have to go to openings more than doing the work you know mm. um, I think that can have quite a negative impact on 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 many aspects of being an artist and on people's health <laughs> yeah and it's London is such a financial barricade for people yeah. um, and it restricts, you know, so many incredible creatives um, from being able to either live in London or those that do to make their best work and sort of realise their potential. Um, and absolutely, I think this kind of this these circumstances of lockdown have have certainly given everyone time to reflect on that and whether, you know, I guess reassess what what they need for their practice when things do go back to normal whether it is a studio or if it's just you know they can work from their macbook if they can work you know at weekends only yeah. and i think by kind of stepping back and thinking what what is necessary for you as an individual yeah, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. might might displace lots of artists to, to other places mm. feels like there's there's a lot of within a lot of people I've spoken to there's been this like hamster wheel of just like just keep going and, mm. and no one really having the time to step back or or opportunity to step back because if they're not in the studio they're working a job or they're trying to have some kind of like social life or you know something like there hasn't there hasn't been that opportunity to reflect on like what and why we're actually doing what we're doing with with some calm or I, I definitely haven't until recently yeah. I found that I've tried to leave a few times and I've somehow always come back to London, mm -hmm. which I don't think is maybe essential. And I, I you know, I have a real love hate relationship. Like about six months ago, I was like, I'm moving back to Glasgow, Susie. I'm selling all the stuff in the studio. I'm going. And like a month later, I was like, 
I don't want to move back to Glasgow. What am I doing? Um, but at that moment in time, I was like, I'm going to go back to where we went to art school, be in my, be in another creative network where I don't have to work so much. And then suddenly I was like, oh, no, no, I, I don't want to leave here. Um, and oh, it's so difficult. I thought about moving to Margate. Mm. I, I moved to America and realised that I didn't like it there. Don't know how to put it. <laughs> Without... <laughs> I was just like, um, I don't like this scene. But at the time, I was like, I think the state's where I need to be. Mm. And I always seem to get dragged back in into London life. And I do think, I don't know, I do think in a way that my studio, my practice might suffer in a way. But then I get a lot of my ideas and the pieces that I do make are from kind of, living in London the conversations I have by meeting another random creative at the pub on a Friday night you know and it's if I was back at my mum's house in the middle of a field in Essex I don't have that primary research it's really difficult but I think there's definitely a love hate and when London's good it's very very good and when it's bad it's really yeah. bad yeah. Um, but I, I really agree with the pub thing you know, yeah. work, work doesn't come from a vacuum, does it? It comes from, mm. from life. Mm. And there's life is more concentrated in London. There's just more mm. of it. Yeah, that's funny, because I, I feel like I have the, a bit of the opposite, because like most of my work comes from like nature and like like yeah. stuff like that. So actually, I struggle quite a bit in London yeah. with the developing of my ideas. I often have to get out of London in order to let the ideas sort of flow and, and find find that and then I come back here to produce, you know. Mm. Uh, so again, it's so it's a big old monster. Like I love London. I love London so much, but I find it very, very hard, you know. Yeah. Um yeah, tough one. <laughs> that leads us on quite nicely to um the different ways you all sustain your practice. So the other jobs or the other Things you do in the background to make sure that you can still get time in the studio. So I think you're, you've all got quite different ways of doing that. So I start. I'm yeah. going to be quite unique, I guess. So um, definitely not, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so before going to art school, I was an entrepreneur. I've had a series of businesses. So my studio is at my home uh it's just through there um and so i don't have that sort of pressure to sustain my my lifestyle if you like although if the businesses aren't going as they're supposed to i do get very distracted um my practice i, I think i said in, in in the introduction that my practice sort of lurches between figurative very traditional figurative sculpture and very political often kinetic work punchy work and i've discovered that figurative sculpture is my um safety zone it's it it's what i return to when i'm not firing on all cylinders with my more conceptual practice um so i'd answer the question slightly differently that sustaining my practice creatively is is uh, more of a challenge for me and I find I constantly return to figurative sculpture and now I've, I keep winning um, commissions for that kind of work which isn't really the work I want to make but it it feels really good to be busy doing that um, so yes that's a very live subject Susie I'm not sure I have the answer to it Um, my my work um, is often informed by my kind of um, my paid work, um, and I've had quite a few jobs um, of varying degrees when I was a student. Um, but it, my first one in sort of teaching or education um, was actually a technician job in a private school, and I got that as soon as I finished my BA. And the reason why I went for it was they have incredible facilities um, 
and it was those kind of hours after sort of school that I was down in the workshop in the studio making my own things and if you have kind of access to you know that that kind of environment then I found it was really useful for kind of building a portfolio together uh, before I went on to a master's course um, and then sort of post MA I've been teaching um, I sort of lecture on a foundation course uh, at college and also a BA um, BA course out in Farnham as well um, and they both came around sort of through conversations with people um, I had a degree sh uh, during my degree show at the Royal College um, Paul Vivian who was sort of head of head of fine art at Farnham at the time came and saw the show saw my work and he invited me to come in as an associate lecturer sort of for a few hours and that developed into you know uh, a day a week and I've been doing that ever since um, and I absolutely love kind of the pedagogical aspects of you know both higher education and further education and working with students for me is, is what I'm really interested in yeah yeah I think that's a really nice it's a really nice thing to be able to do as an artist like I've, I've done a bit of like a few lectures and a few like bits and of, of that kind of work and I've always really enjoyed it it's been a real it's been really challenging in a great way as well because it it really pushes you to respond and know your stuff and yeah I think that's really helpful um, I'd love to do more of that but um my the way that I've maintained yeah where I've supported myself I actually met Alice one uh through supporting myself <laughs> I actually started a, um, a makeup business, which was quite crazy, which kept me sort of running through my BA. So like a week, a month, I might be running around London all night, just painting in nightclubs and doing events and that kind of thing. But um, I've also worked for artists, which has been very informative. And I think also, also really changed my practice quite a lot as well, because I was like painting for a painter maybe like two or three years and I found myself just not being able to paint in my own practice so I think that's something to actually be like quite wary of um, if you're thinking about doing that kind of work and I also think it's um, yeah I think it's actually tougher work than people might think as well um, and um, and actually I've been really lucky to get some great commissions of mad commissions which I'm working on at the moment but they are things <laughs> Susie's laughing <laughs> I'm, I'm painting an enormous fridge freezer at the moment <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> um, in gold and it looks great um, but but those projects do really take up my time so I might do that for like two or three months and then be able to have my own time in the studio itself um, yeah so we get lots of different things really you know um oh, the other one is like I've, I've been working for um an artist who's doing the architecture biennale and it's architecture biennale so helping him with the logistics of putting his show together for that um and i actually really enjoy doing that the, all that organizing and, and making things happen that are quite bonkers i i really enjoy that energy and it makes me a bit more confident in doing knowing that I can do quite you know more challenging stuff in my own practice um, but yeah I think balancing the time is really really difficult um, yeah um, like Roseanne I, well, I, I'm currently working for um, quite a big well-known artist um, in central London and I do I love I love, love, love my job. I get to run around in a forklift for most of my day. <laughs> Quite good fun. It's like a just it's basically a grown up go kart that also goes up and down. It's amazing. Um so I, I love my job. The only thing is I think that because I want you know, I wanted to be in the arts and have a job that I thought would mean something, like as my then to support my practice, but it does leave you but I come home, like you saw me and I started this phone call, I was so hot and exhausted mm. um, from, being, from just running around all day. So I think it has kind of impacted my practice that I'm just exhausted. Absolutely. Being creative 
if you know like just giving that energy to somebody else even even though I'm also kind of buzzing off it off at the time because it's what I'm good at, you know, it's but do you find me... But do you find like, because I, when I was doing it, I found like I was feeding someone, someone, else, someone else's practice so much and it, became, it was quite an ego thing as well. Like, like the, yeah. the aura of like working with, with somebody who's a very successful artist is actually, it's pretty stressful. It's like, and you have to sacrifice so much of your emotional energy to just keeping, you know, keeping the work environment normal. It's not a and normal I think practice. even if you're not working with a, a big name artist, mm. whatever work you're doing yeah, requires headspace. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Your yeah. Yeah, yeah, intellectual yeah. energy is going elsewhere. So as Alice mm. said, you, know, you get home and you're, you're knackered from that mm. and you feel you should be able to then apply yourself to your practice, but you just can't. There's nothing. Mm. Yeah. nothing left is it better then to do a job that's completely kind of not maybe not necessarily as well paid but like mindless mm. well um so that question direct to someone Suze no I was just wondering I was just thinking because it's an interesting one like the kind of job that once you leave the job yeah that's it you don't think about it anymore it doesn't use as much intellectual energy because I think we've all we've probably all done those well, I know I have, Alice, I know you, you have kind of a more like bartending or I worked in a post office once and had to stamp all the stamps and it was so incredibly boring. Yeah, and I'd it's... rather have a forklift. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, then, but then saying this, when, when Susie sent the questions over, I was having a think about them. And I mean, I think as an artist, you just have to kind of, you're going to be exhausted yeah. all the time. I think that's like the kind of key to it. Like, you, you know, like, even in your spare time on a Saturday morning, you're like, oh, should I go for brunch with my friends? Or like, should I be yeah. creating something? I must create. Yeah. You're exhausted all the time. And yeah. like at the start of my career, um, you know, I worked in bars. And because, because I hated working in this pub in North London so much, and I hated my boss, and I hated the, all the people that came in and were rude to me, it actually meant that during the day before six o'clock, I was so proactive with making my own work because I knew at six o'clock I was going, like kind of like Cinderella, I was gonna take my shoes off and go and do something, <laughs> you know, like have to get crackheads out of the toilet. Like it was just, you know, it's, and I do think in a way, like having a job that now that I love running, you know, it's that, oh, it's just so difficult. Part of me sometimes wants to work back in that pub and be making art all day and pouring mm. pints all night. It's a, uh, it's a difficult one to suss out, really. I think the other thing about having a or working in, in an environment you hate is that can be a really rich source mm. for art. So uh, a lot of people I've met through my business career who I really didn't like have found their way into my practice, <laughs> which I really enjoy. <laughs> Probably the same with you, Alice, as well, isn't it? You've you've got a lot of uh, those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of characters that have come into the pubs. Yeah, it's a bit tricky to bash work on on a broadcasted thing, though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no one's not really going to say too much. <laughs> well, I you never know. Not in the pub names, I worked in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But then also, do you know what? Like. Um, I've made some amazing, amazing friends from being in that environment, like working for an artist what, and generally being surrounded by artists, you know, who are doing that job. I've met some of my best friends that way. So there's definitely, there's definitely that, which is, which is pretty rich. We met. We did. <laughs> and then we just keep, we just bump into each other through life. It's lovely. Yeah, it's lovely. <laughs> that was a very strange time in my life. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> Great. Um, a different kind of juggling. Sam and Ian, can you talk a little bit about how you juggle having a family with your practice? Yeah, go on, Ian, after you. Okay, well, I'm I'm guessing Sam's children are younger than mine. Uh, so my kids are aged between 12 and 18. Uh, so... I'm starting really to collaborate with them, which is really, really fantastic. 
Um, and I would have said it was really straightforward until the lockdown, until they're with you all the time, you know, then it becomes really difficult. You know, my 12 year old needs maintenance. The, the other two are less so. Um, but yeah, the, the, the possibilities of, of working with your children as they get older, I think is, is phenomenal, really amazing. And their, their insight, you know, they're, they're massively critical and they're very rarely wrong. You know, it's a really, really valuable uh, input for me. So not difficult though at all. Sam? <laughs> Impossible, no. It's, um, <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. I think, I think the most important thing is um, to not treat them as two separate things. Um, don't have, you know, my practice is over here and my, you know, my son is over here. Um, absolutely, the two exist, uh, they coexist together and um, it's important to be, you know, super flexible with your practice. Um, so whether that means kind of late nights coming down to the studio. So I'm, I'm quite lucky, I have a, um, a basement in the flat that I rent, um, which I've set up as a studio. Um, so it's kind of when when my son Jack is kind of asleep at sort of eight o'clock at night or his nap during the day, I can come down, I can get on with some work. Um, the other really important thing is is not to be hard on yourself. And I think as a parent, that is a big lesson to learn. Um, so if, you know, I'm not dedicating as much time as I would want to to my practice, you know, don't feel guilty about that. It's OK. Um, and I used to give myself quite a hard time on, you know, I'm not, I'm sort of, I'm not making as much work as I should be. Um, but, you know, it's it's a really important lesson to kind of learn is just to sort of relax. And if your practice has to take a back seat because, you know, life takes over, then that's fine. And that's, you know, something which I would sort of reiterate to the students now as well. If there is particular sort of work commitments, um, you know, which, which, Sort of overtake your practice then you know that's fine to take you know a step back for a week or two and just and reevaluate there's no kind of rush with with making i completely agree with that that's a really really good point not not least that you know when your children are small uh you don't get that time back whereas yeah. you do get time to make art back so yeah no i completely agree so Thank you. Um, I've got loads more questions, but I'm just going to, I think we'll just, I'll just do one final one and then open it up to the, um, the floor because I've, I've realised that I've asked it. Um, so I thought a, a nice one to end on from me would be, um, is there anything you wish you'd done differently straight after art school or something you wish you'd known? Yeah, I would. Um, I think, and it leads on from what Sam said, really, because I think, I think sometimes I think I need to be a filtered, like clean, like you know, version of myself and present that to an to an art world, whoever that art world might be. And I think that's so, I just think that's so redundant. I think that's such a misdemeanor. Like, I think it's really important to do all the things that do feed your practice. Like, you know, you don't work in a vacuum. Absolutely. We have families, we have social things, and that's really what art is often, you know, all stoked by. Um, like, it took me ages, it took me ages to realise that actually my artwork shouldn't just be um, painting. And and while I was on my MA at the RCA, it became about it became about yoga, it became about trauma therapy, it became about sculpture, installation, music, like like everything that that I would interact with. So I just think. I just think be really ballsy. Actually, I wish I'd been more ballsy about who I really was and not think that I had to be something palatable for an art world, which I think it, it's just that's a stupid cycle. And it's, yeah, that's it. Um, I would advise people to um, to practice their written work. That sounds really boring. Um, when I when I finished my BA, I was like, I just want to make work for the rest of my life, and that would be amazing. Um, and now I find that being an artist is actually so many applications. 
and unless you've got a kind of a watertight application and, and real kind of contextual support for your practice you are never going to be able to show anything and i think that's so important to have that kind of um theoretical or written side uh, or even just being able to articulate your practice is so so important and that's probably what i would have told myself to to rehearse more yeah and i think it was it's really like i realized that you've got to write a load of mess as well in order to get it you know, <laughs> yeah you really <laughs> you know, do. You write really and write do. and write and it doesn't matter if it's crap it's great because then you don't have to send that crap but at least it's out of your system and you know yeah. you know more of what you do need to send yeah you know, I think that's important. Um, <clears throat> I think the maybe the one thing I would have done differently in the years after graduating would be to be more consistent. I think networking, applying for things, uh, making opportunities, just being entrepreneurial about the whole thing when i'm on form i can be very productive i can do a lot of that you know and when i'm not on form it falls off a cliff and nothing happens and i get miserable about the fact there's nothing happening so that's what i would do differently and a little point that just leads on from the writing point that sam and rosanna have made is how we talk about our practice and how we talk about our work uh, the the british are, are terribly self-deprecating um and so we have this horrible habit of talking about our work in a negative way or talking about our practice in a self-deprecating way and people won't buy art that isn't exciting and it isn't what you're proud of it's not your latest best greatest achievement do you know what i mean nobody wants to buy the thing that you're not excited about uh, so I think that's a kind of thing to have in the back of your mind to to get rid of this English obsession with self-deprecation and get on with promoting yourself I think um, my piece of advice or what I think I should have would have liked to have known at the beginning is your practice is kind of like a relationship and it is a relationship and I think I've kind of worked this out in the past year that it doesn't you don't it doesn't have to be good all the time. And there are periods where it's frustrating and there are periods where you just hate it. You hate everything you do, like maybe like a partner, like, why are you so annoying? <laughs> but then but then it does kind of come together and once. But then this was this was a time in my studio where I was talking to myself at objects. I was like, well, this has gone a bit. This has gone too far. But. It is, a, it is a relationship and it does take work. And if you, you know, if there are periods that you're just not making things, then that's okay. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure that you should be doing something all the time. And and it is important to have coffees with people. I always class those, you know, bits of part of my practice as well, having coffees with other artists. And mm. it's still part of your practice. Just because you haven't got this finished thing in cast bronze doesn't mean that it's not important um yeah that's my yeah, advice I used to look, that was great like it was a really important comment from someone at the RC, like one of the tutors at the rca he was like you're here all the time and you're not making your best work like you need to go out like you need to be mm -hmm. thinking like the studio is for producing not necessarily for thinking like mm -hmm. i think we can so mm -hmm. and isolate ourselves yeah, yeah. it's going to happen like that it doesn't you know I think and it's a really good idea to think of your practice like a relationship yeah. and to try and do the sometimes they're really annoying <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and to do the sorts of things that will nurture your practice mm -hmm. even though exactly. that's not necessarily going to be producing art now producing mm. finished things and don't do that which i think i don't know i definitely fall into it all the time uh, the trap of comparison so when oh, you're yeah. saying like, coffee with a friend and chatting yeah. about it, or then looking mm. on Instagram afterwards and comparing with someone who's just had it. Oh, yeah. 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 I think good we were talking bit. about this the other day, me and Susie, and it was just like, you just can't, we've got to stop. Because also, yeah. like, I think it's really important to realise that, like, your your practice is totally unique. Like, it really yeah. is, you know? Also, so it's, a, it's a game you can't possibly win. 
Because yeah. if you're doing much better than someone, then they're not a, a valid comparator. But if they're doing much better than you, then you're crap. <laughs> <laughs> right, love it, exactly. So just stop checking Instagram, yeah, for God's sake. Stop. <laughs> just get on with the work. <laughs> Okay, so we open it up to everyone else. If, if you guys want to put your videos back on and um, unmute yourself, and we'll open up to questions. Any questions from the floor? I, I'd like to say something, but it's not necessarily a question. I, I have really, really enjoyed everything that you've all said. I've been oh, thank you, Robert. Copious amounts of notes here. And they're exactly the way I always take notes. When I go back to the top of the page, I can't remember what that actually <laughs> But luckily, Susie's recorded it. And that is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to listen to it again because I found it so useful. I know I'm at a very different place in my life uh, to you guys because I'm retired. Um, but, you know, I've just come out of a six-year art bubble, two years of an access course, and a part-time BA, and I didn't think I'd meet the cliff edge because I, did, it, I, I didn't have to work. I don't have to make it a career, but it certainly happened. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I really need to develop ways of maintaining relationships and I'm going to use the really wrong word. I was going to say creatives. I mean, people that engage in artistic endeavor in because I started out this not simply to get a certificate, but because I recognize that the actual making that I do keeps me in the right place of mind, keeps me on the right side of sanity. And so everything that you've all contributed, you know, I think Rosanna said about, you know, degree show, and then all of a sudden there was a sense of anxiety there. You know, what's coming next? I, I recognise that. And um, yeah, all good. All good. So as the others ask questions, I might actually go through my notes and see <laughs> if I can actually decipher them. But I've also, I, Rosanna, I'd love to find um, if you have a website or something. Why, while all these um, videos were off, I've checked out Ian and I've checked out Alice and I've checked out Sam and been looking at your work. And it's all, it, it's wonderful. It, it's been a pleasure to be here tonight. And you. Thanks, Robert. So lovely. And yes, I do. It's rosannadean.com. <laughs> Sorry? It's just it's just my name dot rosannadean.com. Okay. That's such that's such lovely comment. That's so sweet of you. Yeah. And we've got a question in the chat about um do you think that having an MA on your CV gets you more winning applications? Um and it says I know you've tried to answer that, but I think you do need it. I think that I think the work speaks for itself more now. I think it's become more democratic in a way by like the platforms that people are given. Um, I mean, present your work to its best quality and have confidence in, and like Ian was saying, like pick it up and write and write well about it. Just present yourself well. Yeah. Um, I think people know that it's really difficult to finance an MA now. Like it's mm. and it, it can be not yeah. the right thing to do. So. Um, yeah, be brave. <laughs> it's it's certainly open doors, and I think for for job applications, um, I would I would say this is important. Absolutely. You say or um or any jobs. Mm. Teaching, I guess. Yeah, I I think for any jobs, any jobs that is is such an easy way when you've got a big pile of CVs to differentiate people. Yeah, you can't lie. I think people are still people are still impressed when you name drop, <laughs> and the RCA is still a name drop. Really, that's yeah, that's definitely true. But I but I don't think it's the only way. Certainly. Do you yeah. think um, one of the more um, left field art schools that we mentioned earlier, uh, the Art School of the Dam, Serps Banana, one of those, would that would that kind of an exp uh, an MA get you the same jobs or not? You don't get a certificate, do you? No, but I think Terps has got a group, it's got such a strong reputation 
And I think people yes. are really acknowledging that. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot of our painting tutors are, are also tutors on, you know, like the correspondence at Turfs as quality, okay. quality like artists, you know. So um, I think it's becoming more respected, definitely. Mm. Um, I'm not sure about the about the others, but Turks is for sure. And I think that's a really that's a really heartening thing, isn't it, to see that that alternative other ways to models. do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's yeah, I think that's really encouraging. There's there's certainly I I think this kind of um, destabilizing of a hierarchy where um, the tutors are seen as as completely as equals to the the students. Um, and I think there's much more crossover with sort of showing work together um, and also, you know, employment opportunities. I should think there's plenty of kind of um, people who have gained work from doing things like Turf's Banana with some of the artists who come in. And you know, I've also, I've got friends who haven't got an MA but have, left, have gone in as visiting tutors on an MA course, mm -hmm. um, just on the strengths of their shows and the students seeing those shows and saying like, we'd like to speak to that artist so I think, there's loads, I think it's really I think it's I think it's detrimental to think that there's only one way you know I really do and I think we don't really want to live in a world like that anymore to be honest. It's also yeah. that fix now of PhD as well once you've got your MA oh my God. and do a PhD and well, it's a constant carrot, isn't it? It's like before they were like, you can't, you can't be a tutor, you can't be a tutor, visiting tutor if you don't have an MA. And now it's like, well, everyone's got to have a PhD, and it just goes on and on. Like we've got to be quite creative and just trust ourselves and get out and do things, you know. I guess it goes back to it if it's right for your practice, always. Like definitely, of course. That's the question you have to, I think, ask with any of these things. It's like it, it's not just about ticking a box. It's what's what's best for your for your work. Mm. Um, any other questions? I want to say something. Hi, Nick. Mm -hmm. Hi. Always want to say something. <laughs> I think. I think. Thank you, guys. By the way, it was lovely to see all of you. Um, I think it's it's also I guess just a comment. It's really important to kind of figure out where your art practice sits within your own life and within the larger scheme of your own world and your own culture. Um, mm. I mean, yeah, there are different alternative so so sorry, sources and different communities. I mean, there's communities in every city, regardless of whether it's London or Leeds or Bristol or Paris or Amsterdam, you know, I mean, there's always, there's always a, a group somewhere doing something. So I think a lot of it has to be with where you want to live. Yeah. Right. And, and that, that was the big thing is like, yeah, you can be in London and you can go to the RCA and yeah, having the RCA on your CV matters. You can say it doesn't matter when you go there and you have it on your CV, but for everybody that doesn't have it on their CV, it absolutely matters. Mm -hmm. I got my flat because I told my landlord I was going to the RCA. I'm convinced I have my job right now because the two artists I work for went to the RCA and four other people there went to the RCA. Like there's an RCA mafia, do you know what I mean? Like it's, yep. it's real and it makes a difference. But there's also, and it's international. Whereas like Terps Banana, you go outside of the London or the UK, people are like, yeah, okay, maybe they've heard of it within close realms or within the community. But there's also, a, you have to kind of figure out who you want to be as an artist because also yeah. these, these institutions are neoliberal monstrosities. Mm -hmm. right? This is everything that's considered successful within these institutions is based on the white male paradigm mm -hmm. of what success is and within art history. And so this is where the competition is of like, are you good enough to go and be successful, great artist within this realm of, of white male history, right? Mm -hmm. with, with the few white women thrown in for good measure and this art market and this art and how, and who shapes the art market and, and how you want to fit into that if you want to fit into that. I think that's so valid. I think you have to really interrogate what world you want to live in in like the future and currently. And I think you have to make your decisions according to that. Yeah. You know? And you can also straddle both, right? You can you can mm -hmm. straddle both and you can and you can kind of intersect these places a lot of times if you you know are are able to intersect them in, in a particular way. For sure, but I think it's it's really I don't know I got I got caught in that with with the MA and the and the hyper competitive nature of it and I almost found it a disservice to the practice. 
to be fair. So, I don't know. That, I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks. It's very important. To think, I think it's a really important thing to think about. Like, just when you're making these decisions, like, who do you want to be? What do you, what, how do you want to be? Yeah. yeah. And there's also many art worlds. So it's like, which art world do you want to fit into? And how do you want to navigate that? And which ones do you feel you're uh, like going to suck your soul? And I don't know. It's like, yeah. So we're yeah. Here, what kind of person you want to be alongside mm. an artist and every every opportunity you get and every potential commission or um, person buying your work, it, they have their own background and it's how much do you want to look into that and kind of navigate within, like, I know, you know, we all, I think, say to say, would love to be in the Tate, but the people giving money to the Tate, it's, it's, got, a, it's got a history, like, I don't know, just like, what it's worth. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think like what world do we want to live in? Like mm. I think that's so important. And and I know it's definitely of course it's a privilege and of course like of oh God of course it's a privilege, but but it's also like how bitter how bitter do we feel about these institutions that we're that we're allowing to like still influence, you know, like mm. we've got to be brave. We've got to be really ballsy and brave and mm -hmm. to think that there's that there are other ways. Like if you want to do if you want to be an artist that just does workshops and community projects, like do that. Like, don't think that you've got to sell your and like do a different job. You know. Yeah, and I own it. Thank you. And, and also, all of all of the problems that you have now, as a, let's say a small time artist, are absolutely magnified when you go big time. Like just oh, because, yeah. Just because you have a massive blue chip behind you does not mean you've got it figured out and the stress. <laughs> this is what I was going to ask oh, Alice. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was going to ask Alice that, bro. Like, 20 people to make this thing happen and you have deadlines and all of it and you're still and you're still looking for money all the time. Yeah, you're constantly broke and you're mental <laughs> all the time. Mm. Well, like whether you choose to like employ people on a part-time basis and an ad hoc basis when you need or if you have full-time staff yeah. that is a serious burden and, a, and like a pressure that adds another complexity to your life and I think it's like I think we'd all love love an assistant it'll be great but it that comes with a huge responsibility so the more yeah, yeah that's totally right the more, the more your career advances in whatever well whatever we define success as whatever. it seems like it's exactly the same thing it's just bigger lots, like bigger bigger drops if you you know i definitely found that when i was working as an assistant like it's the same thing it's the same worries right you lose a bit of freedom like i quite like at the moment the fact that i'm not that successful or whatever that you know so i can make the kind of work i want to make whereas if you start getting more successful financially you then have to churn out certain types of work because it's popular on the market and that comes oh yeah well just find the happy medium don't like just don't try to just <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions john did you have one i think you unmuted yourself and then muted yourself back again so i'm not sure if you for me yeah i thought you had one okay. <laughs> you on... no I've, I've enjoyed the chat though for sure um I think everyone said some really good points that I found really interesting. Um, yeah, I don't think I've got a specific question though. No, sorry, um, it's just you, you, um, I thought you were trying to... Yeah, I mean, I, there, there is something I've found myself thinking during this conversation, and that's about the DIY art schools and everything. And, um, and you know, when we were talking about going to big institution, institutional art schools and that kind of thing, and I just think um, someone else said that it's it's easy to say that I think it actually might have been you Victoria you said something about um it's easy to say uh you know I'm not getting anything from this when you're in the Royal College but it's actually really helpful to have the Royal College you know other people outside of it don't have that on their CV and that's a problem but um I've always compared what I'm doing with like the music um scene and I, I think a lot of musicians start off in this kind of DIY aesthetic where they're Kind of um, putting on their own shows and getting their name out there and I've always kind of drawn parallels like that and um, I think that's what's really great um, about these alternative art schools uh, even if they're not like School of the Damned or Open School East or the ones that everyone's heard of like there's a really good one in Southend called Toma and they're just doing their own thing in a shopping centre and 
um, you know, they, their ethos is so good that they get really good artists to come and um, come and speak there and do tutorials and things. And like people, you know, um, I think it was Sarah Lucas um, donated quite a lot of money to make sure that the column in their window always had art on it. And so they kind of use that money to make like a, a commission and um, they're, they're always, I'm always kind of um, quite taken aback by what they're doing as a group. And um, yeah, I just found myself sort of thinking about that and how, uh, you know, when I went to the Slade, I kind of thought that one of the biggest things I'd get out of it is, is actually like my peer group, um, aside from any of the institutional stuff. And um, I guess, uh, yeah, I don't know where I'm going on that, but you put me on the spot, Susie. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, John. Can, also nice to see you. But can I see, uh, ask you what the group was called? Toma, because I'm not familiar with that. Toma, yeah, it stands for the other MA. Oh right, yeah, okay. Now I'm familiar with that. Stands for the what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other MA. It stands for the uh, other MA. The other mm. MA, yeah. Okay. Any last? Sorry, I'll wait. Comments. Um. I I wanted to um, just say something, be, you know, pulling it back to kind of, um, you know, thinking who the audience is, who's going to sort of re-listen to this. Hopefully, I'm thinking sort of third year BA students. Um, one sort of not-for-profit company really helped me. Um, they're called UK New Artists, um, formerly UK Young Artists. Um, but they have been brilliant for kind of supporting, showing my work. Um, I've had sort of paid opportunities through them. I've done residencies. I've been all over the country. Um, and then last year, I got to sort of go to Shanghai for, for three weeks as well, which has been absolutely brilliant. Um, so they're a fantastic company to sort of be part of and be with. Um, so their only criteria, um, UK new artists, is... Um, artists who have in the first 10 years of their practice. So 10 years of leaving art school, basically. Um, but they've currently got one um, sort of opportunity open now, and it's for a Leicester show, which is happening next year, part of a sort of national festival they do every two years. But um, they're just, I couldn't recommend them enough. They've been brilliant to work with, and they're just fantastic sort of opportunities for sort of critical dialogue and, and everything else as well. Have they changed the, it used to be the the age thing as well, they they taken that away? Yeah, they've taken that away as part of a sort of rebranding thing. Yeah. Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it was, uh, you know, I've, I've been part of quite a few things, you know, with them and they're, they're talking about how they can include more people, more artists and sort of, you know, as this thing gradually grows. Um, because they've sort of secured a lot more funding now as well, so their projects are a lot more ambitious. And one of the things was, you know, they want to help people who aren't necessarily at the top of their careers, um, but at the same time, they don't want to sort of push people away who are, you know, over 30, over 35, whatever it was before. Um, so, yes, yeah, the first 10 years of graduating from BA or MA. Amazing. <laughs> well, I think Nicola has a question. Oh, you're still muted. Mm -hmm. One sec. Um, I think you have to unmute yourself. Oh, <laughs> still muted. Um, asking more about the balance between parenthood and being an artist. Nico, was that more on? Do you want to type it in the chat? Was that like obviously yeah. Ian and Sam talked about it a little bit? Oh, you, you go. You're on mute. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you can. Oh, fantastic. Okay. Yeah, and no, I was really interested in your comments about juggling with family because um, I'm 48 and I'm doing my third year part time of my BA and I'm sort of new to all of this and it's um, for me. A very interesting juggling game, and um, I find that I'm pulled in all directions. And I just think I don't even know if I'm going to get my way out of this maze. <laughs> it just feels, shall I persist? How much shall I persist with this? But I mean, I'm very passionate about what I do in my art, but 
it sometimes I just feel that um, I just hit brick wall, I hit hit a brick wall, and I just think, God, oh, how am I going to keep going? I've got my boys are thirteen and sixteen, so um, you know that's challenging in itself. But um, yeah, and I think that guilt about constant guilt about not making enough or or being out there doing doing what I want as well as juggling you know the kids and everything else associated with it. It's just I find it tough. But, I think um, I think Nicola, it, it is tough. Um, but what Sam said earlier about not beating ourselves up about it, you know, not giving in to this internal pressure to constantly make constantly. Yeah, that was really achieve. interesting. I think it's a really important point. You know, we. You know, it's not many years and your boys will have left home and then you'll have all the time in the world, don't you? I know. I know. Yeah, that, that's why I also asked about the MA thing, because I'm going to give it a break for a good couple of years, really, um, till I'm at that point. And then I really want to give it my all, I think. So I'm sort of wondering what's going to happen between those years. But I think I'll just I'll just chip away at it, I think. And um, I suppose it's about self-satisfaction. And not you talk about all the different levels of success and, um, you know, having RCA on your CV and uh, applying for things. But actually, I, I think I've got to find that balance between success and personal satisfaction, really. Yeah, and I think I think Rosanna made a, a point relevant to that, that I can't remember how you said it, Rosanna, but this idea that you'd you were presenting a, a clean yeah. and perfect image to the, mm -hmm. the world. And it it's it's not necessary you know there is no one way to success there's not not one perfect model of being an artist we're all unique and they you know we've all got a different stage in our careers and different stage in our lives and it's all fine isn't it also what is success like you know obviously i alluded to earlier and if anyone is listening from the tapes very interested but like <laughs> <laughs> Like what is for me i realize more and more success is to keep making work and yeah. people mm. to keep interesting work and rosanna yeah. and i talked about it yesterday for that also not to come at a complete sacrifice of everything else in your life like i don't yeah. want luxury but i do want a life where i'm not killing myself to make my work and so yeah, and, if yeah. i'm satisfied with making work for me that's success but yeah. Maybe to someone else it's different. Maybe it's loads and loads of money, or maybe it's loads of like really top shows. But at the end of the day, being an artist is an interesting life, right? You meet interesting people, you have great, mm. you get to do what you love. That's success in itself, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, I like that. Be, be generous with your success as well, because like, you know, the fact that we've all given an hour, an hour and a half tonight, you know, to what to, to sort of for our own development, to share ideas and to have this discussion, you know, that's success in a way. You know, anyone who's put time aside for their own practice, for their own sort of personal growth in some way, that's success, isn't it? Definitely. And I also think like like every day things change, you know, and like this idea of, of who we want to be and how we want to do things. Like, I think. I, I had this notion of like how to be an artist in my 20s, which was desperately unhealthy, actually. Yeah. And I don't think it benefited me at all my artwork, particularly. I found it very limiting when, you know, maybe being more involved with people outside of the studio would have been, I think that's what I found is much more helpful now, you know, and it's totally radicalized my practice. Like, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I this, yeah. I, keep chipping at it it doesn't matter like some days you might be working and other days you don't but those it's about you actually and yeah, yeah. Don't, don't try and present anything just be just try and do 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 what's really sincere i think i i've got a friend who writes as well and and they like people just want something authentic so just you know yeah. just, just do that yeah okay great thanks great advice thank you yeah, and I think also what um, Ian said earlier about including the children and getting their opinions and things, because um, I've not really done that. I've not really brought them into my world 
as well. So I think I might do that. And that will then also give me the confidence to be who I am and make what I want. So um, thank you for all your comments. Thank you. Um, it's probably a nice positive note to end on. Um, so we do this every time, if everyone could just unmute and we can give our panellists a round of applause and say thank you so much for giving your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.